Thank you very much. I, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm talking to the choir, and that is good. But you know, if I can't get my message across to you in a very convincing, long-lasting way, then, then I got a problem. So I'm going to try really hard this morning, and maybe with a, a bit of excess passion, I'm going to try and get across to you something that's very meaningful for me, and that is the health of people. You know, a lot of folks, they, they, they criticize me from the point of view that I'm so enthusiastic about this, but I can't help it because, you know, I see people suffering, and I also see the advantages that occur when people learn a very simple message, which, by the way, is cost-free and profit-free. So I can't be anything less than passionate about it because the pain, the suffering, as well as the joy is so great. So I share in that, and I hope that I get you to share in it too, and I hope you become messengers of this very important message for your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, because they need to hear this. And so hopefully what I can do in the next 55 minutes is I can seat firmly in your mind and your heart the truth of a healthy diet and the strength of the human body. What the... Uh, the title of the talk is today is uh, Diet versus Drugs, Patients versus Profits, and uh, I only add this for certain groups, Doctors versus Drug Pushers. <laughs> we have to get some common ground here. We have to get some common understanding that we all agree upon, and if you have any problem with the next few slides, don't hesitate to raise your hand and tell me where you think differently. Mary and I were at a restaurant recently, and a lady came up to us, and she said, you know, I'd like to take your picture, it'll only cost you $10 to have a picture of your family. And I looked at her and I thought, you know, I really don't want a picture of my family, but you know, that's kind of a neat idea. And I looked over to my left and I saw this family that you see here. I saw this family here sitting to my left, they were speaking Japanese and they were eating rice and vegetables and a little bit of fish. And I said, take me a picture of that family, I'll buy it for you for $10. And so she did, she came back and sold it to me and I said, hey, that's pretty neat. I wonder if I can do that again. So I said, how about taking a picture of the family to my right? And so she took a family, a picture of this family to my right, and I paid her $10. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Shoo. There we go. I took a picture of that family, had her take a picture of that family, and uh, she sold it to me for $10. And these people were speaking perfect pidgin English. They've been in the United States of Hawaii, America forever. Can you tell the difference in these people? They're all Japanese ancestry. Can you tell the difference? Now the big question. The big question is what happened to these people between the first and second and third and fourth generation? What happened? Did they catch a virus? Did they change their genes? Did some mystery fall upon them? What happened to these people? Okay, we all have to be on the same page here. You have to understand why the first and second generation looks well and the third and fourth generation is so fat and sick. You must understand and agree with me that the problem is not with genetics. It's not due to the wrath of God. It's not due to some virus. It's not due to some mystery. It's they gave up their rice-based, vegetable-based diet and started eating American foods full of fat, meat, cheese, oil, cholesterol. That's what happened. You can see it. Can't you see it? If you can't see it, go to the airport tomorrow, or excuse me, Monday. Go to the airport. Stand around and watch people come through the airport. You'll see those that are from the Middle East, Far East, from various countries where they aren't, quote, fully Americanized. They're still trim, healthy, hearty, young-looking people. Then watch the people who've lived here for a while and see what happens to them as they learn the rich American diet. Now the big question for you, what if we took the second family, the ones that are fat and greasy and unhealthy looking, and we gave them a one-way ticket to Japan? And we sent them to a farming village and we told them that you are going to eat with the farming family, rice and vegetables, three times a day, and you're going to work in the fields. What do you think would happen to them? Anybody have a problem with this? They would get thin, they'd get off their diabetic pills, their blood pressure would come down, they'd look younger, right? We're all in agreement, okay. So now you understand the problem and the solution and it's no more complicated than that and it costs absolutely nothing. Now for the next bit of agreement that we have to come to. <clears throat> is this is not just a problem of Asian people, this is a problem you see all over the world. 
If you look at various populations of people, for example, I hate to bring this up on such a nice day, but we have been observing the folks in the Middle East suffering lots of turmoil, lots of, lots of uh, unhappy situations, and we've been also shocked by various pictures of people in the Middle East, such as the torture pictures, which I'm sure vividly come to your mind. Those young men that you saw, did they have a gut hanging like this? Absolutely not. Those people from the Middle East live on a diet that's 71% carbohydrate. They live on rice and chickpeas and little bits of lamb and little bits of dairy products. But otherwise, they're generally healthy, trim, hardworking people. Now, you take these people from the Middle East and you move them to Lodi or to Los Angeles, to your hometown. You keep them there for a, a few years or a generation and they get fat and sick just like the rest of Americans. You can see this around the world. For example, in Africa, the first case of rheumatoid arthritis was described in Africa in 1957. The first case of lupus, we're going to be talking about these two diseases. Deadly diseases, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. First case of rheumatoid arthritis was described in Africa in 1957. The first case of lupus was described in 1960 in Africa. In the United States of America, the highest incidence of both of these deadly diseases among African Americans. So what happened in 40 years? They changed their genes? No, they learned the American diet. That's what happened. You get the picture. Okay. So now on to the next basic principle that we have to agree upon now that we're all set on what happens when people go from a diet of, of, of plant foods, starches, vegetables, fruits, to a diet of Krispy Kreme donuts, Burger Kings, McDonald's, beef steaks, cheese, and so on. You've got it right clear in your mind. And you also know how to cure these people. Send them back to their native lands and diets and so on. Okay, next concept. And this is one that I specifically speak to those of you who are healers, nurses, doctors, health professionals, and so on. I must talk to you in terms of your patient care. If you have a smoker who's coughing and hacking and very sick with lung disease, how do you treat that patient? Do you give them smoker's vitamins? Do you give them cough syrups? How does a proper health professional care for that kind of person? Any problem with this? Do you know how to cure this person? Do you know how to deal with this person? What do you do? Absolutely, you know what to do. You get them to quit their habit. How about this person? There's your skid row drunk. What do you do? You give them vitamins for their alcoholism? You give them a little diuretic to help with the ascites? Is that your primary therapy? Of course not. What do you do? You get them to quit the, the substance of abuse. Of course you do. We're all in agreement. Anybody have any problem with those two basic concepts I just gave you? On what causes disease, what cures disease, and how an appropriate health professional acts? No problem. Thank you. Now, how do we take care of this guy? I'll tell you how we take care of them. We take care of them just like your mother and father and brother and sister and son and daughter and friends are taken care of. In this country, we drug them to death. We give them something for their blood pressure, something for their diabetes, something for their constipation. It goes on and on and on, and nobody deals with the problem. You know what the problem is. You just told me you knew what the problem was. You know what the solution is. Why don't we deal with the problem? What do we do? We just take and we fill their medicine cabinets with drugs. That's what we do. That's all the patient knows. Just a medicine cabinet full of drugs. And I want to challenge you right now that you do not know anyone with chronic disease who has ever been cured with these drugs. Stop me. Stop me. If you go to the physician's desk reference, the PDR, which every doctor has, and many of you buy at Walden's or other bookstores, physician's desk reference. It has in there, as you flip through the index, it has a whole section called anti-diabetic medications where they advertise glucophage and glyburide and all kinds of actose and all kinds of other pills for diabetics. Anti-diabetic medications. I want to know if there's a single person, there's over a thousand people in this room, as a single person, is anybody in this room ever been cured with anti-diabetic medications of diabetes? Have you ever met a patient? Have you ever seen a patient? If you're a doctor, have you ever heard of a patient ever being cured with anti-diabetic medications? I never have either. So where does the term anti-diabetic medication come from? Got me, but I see every day 
Just like in those first two pictures I showed you, first three or four pictures, I see every day if you take people who are sick from eating too much rich food, you put them on healthy food, their diabetes goes away. That's anti-diabetic medication. You do the same thing you do with the smoker and the drunk. You stop the cause of the problem. Okay, let's move along. This is medicine for the 21st century. Fexorol, which is the top pill, guarantees weight loss, but the side effects are attacks of the ear canal. So we have Odental, which controls ear canal, but enlarges the prostate. So we have Nexorol, which restores the prostate, but it infects the esophagus. So we have BL, BLPHM-2, which disinfects the esophagus, but causes fetid lung. But thank goodness we have Zardo, which removes fetid lung carnical but results in uncontrolled weight gain. <laughs> why is this funny? Because it's true. That's why. Because that's what medicine's all about. And those of you who are, have problems, chronic illnesses, you, you, you know, you got a bag full of pills sitting at home that you got to take all day long. You probably even have these little boxes so you can measure out which pills you take at what time of the day. And you're not a bit better for it. You're still sick because you haven't done what we just talked about a few minutes ago, which you all agreed upon. Next slide. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> OK. So let's talk about prescriptions in the United States. In 1985, there were 109 prescriptions written for every 100 office visits. In 1999, 146 prescriptions for every 100 office visits. Most of this has to do with the aggressiveness of the drug companies. This is one single issue of Newsweek magazine. In one single issue, they advertise for you Zocor, a cholesterol-lowering medication, Vioxx, something for your arthritis, Nexium for your stomach indigestion, a pill for diabetes, one for flu, one for eczema. To the consumer, they advertise six prescription medications in one magazine meant for the consumer. You don't turn on a TV anymore where you don't have two or three advertisements in one segment of advertisements that sells prescription drugs to consumers. What is the world coming to? I mean, doctors ought to be absolutely furious, much less patients. But, you know, some doctors really don't care. I don't think the doctors in this room I'm talking to, but some don't care cause, because it's a lot faster to get the patient in the office and out, isn't it? You have them come in, you say, what do you want? They tell you, you write the prescription, you just say goodbye. It's a nice way to make a lot of money. So, this is the kind of consumer we have. I was depressed because my Kialis and my Viagra didn't work, so I took Prozac, but my Celebrex, and my Vioxx canceled out the Zocor and the Z Oh, boy. But the consumer's in charge. There's no end to cost. Between 1997 and 2000, there was an 18% per year, per year, get that, per year increase in spending on retail outpatient drugs, $80 billion to $155 billion increase between that three-year period of time. It's expected by the year 2011, 15% of the money spent in this country will be on prescription drugs. I doubt it. I bet it's by 2005. These guys are so good. They are so effective at their advertising. They'll get it from 10 to 15% by next year. All right, let's talk about some options. Let's examine some of the options when it comes to drug therapy. Diet versus drugs. Is there an alternative? Let's start with the number one and number four prescription drugs in this country. What I'm showing you over the next few minutes are the actual statistics on what's being sold in this country in terms of drug therapy. Number one and number four are cholesterol-reducing medications. They're called statins. They're very popular. By the way, I do use them. I am a doctor. I write prescriptions. My prescription pad, however, lasts about a year per pad. But I do write prescriptions, and I do not want you to think about me as an alternative or a holistic doctor, because I am not. I'm a board-certified internist. I am a regular doctor, and I'm very proud of it. But I practice very conservative medicine. I do not give people drugs for dietary diseases, unless it's the last resort. And so I do prescribe cholesterol-lowering medications to my patients, no question about it, because they do work, but it's the last thing I do, not the first. So let's talk about these medications. They do work. They inhibit the production of cholesterol in the body. They reduce the risk of heart attacks and death, and also some other things. 
But is that the way we should be dealing with the problem? No, of course, we should stop eating the cholesterol, the eggs, the chickens, the cows, the pigs, the fishes. Cholesterol is only in animal products. That's what we should stop eating, and as a result, the cholesterol goes down. Average drops in cholesterol in my patients. This is work I did at St. Helena Hospital. I was at St. Helena Hospital, which is an Adventist hospital for 16 years. And this is some of the data we accumulated. In 11 days, the average drop in cholesterol in 1,250 patients was 29 points. If you start with a high cholesterol, the drop is 65 points. That's better than drugs. 65 point drop in cholesterol in 11 days. If you started with a high cholesterol, drop triglycerides in half with a healthy diet. Now I have to just put a side note in here. Some of you are trying to get healthy in terms of cholesterol and triglycerides and you're eating quote a vegetarian diet and you're hitting the fruits and the fruit juice is too hard. If, you, if you're too concentrated on the sugars what happens is your triglycerides and sometimes your cholesterol goes up. So you need to back off on those to get cholesterol and triglycerides down even more effectively. Joe Wysocki, he's an Adventist. Yeah he is. And uh, I met him I met him on, a, on one of our cruises, Alaska cruise, but he and his wife have been writing me for a long time before. He's also a physician, he's an internist, and he practices in San Antonio, Texas. And he got excited about good diet because of his wife, Glenn. Glenn got excited about good diet because she was tired of being constipated. This is, the, this is the interesting thing. You know, I never know who's going to listen to my message. Some of you are out there thinking, well, you know, it's only those people who are ready to have bypass surgery, have got cancer, or so on, are going to be interested enough in this kind of message. No way. I mean, I know people, and you do too, who will smoke cigarettes through their endotracheal tubes. And I know people who are just a little constipated that will go way out of their way to change their diet to solve the problem. I never knew who's going to change. That's why I give the message to everybody. It could be, quote, what you think are the little things that are enough to motivate many people, or even big things won't motivate other people. So it really doesn't make a lot of difference. I think everybody deserves this message, and we will see who responds. Well, Glenn, she responded because she was constipated and arthritic. And she changed her diet. She brought Joe along on our Alaska trip. We take, uh, well, one trip a year now, but we'll start again true. And we used to take two trips a year. We take 50 to 150 people on vacations. Why do we do that? We do that because when you go on vacation, the average weight gained is eight pounds in seven days. And one cruise we went on, it was a 600 passenger ship, and they told me that the average number of people who finished the seven day cruise in the cooler was two. And they had a record, and that was six corpses in the cooler secondary to the midnight buffet. And I don't think you ought to go on a trip and get fat and sick and die, do you? Of course not. So anyways, we started these cruises and other kinds of trips about uh, 10 years ago. Our next one, which is next month, is to Costa Rica, which is our favorite destination. Okay. Anyway, they went on the Alaska trip. Joe, he was a little resistant. You know, he's a doctor. He knew all about this kind of stuff. But he eventually did learn, dropped his cholesterol from 221 to 121, lost 35 pounds. Now that we're talking about constipation, let's go there for a minute. Oh. I want to tell you about a study that was done in the New England Journal of Medicine on children. Now those of you who are general practitioners know this is the norm, not the exception. I mean, when I was a GP, I'm an internist now, but I was a GP for three years, I will tell you, I would see the kids, and the kids were terribly constipated, bloody bowel movements, you know, half an hour in the bathroom, that kind of thing. And the mother thought nothing of it, because she read two chapters of Reader's Digest too every time she went there. This is a common, severe, painful, embarrassing problem. And this is a reflection of what's going on. What they did is they took children with constipation. They had uh, 65 severely constipated kids. To get in that category, you had to have a bowel movement every 3 to 15 days, and usually with a laxative. This is not that unusual, folks. And what they did is they took them off the cow's milk, and they found that 70% of them found complete relief just getting off the cow's milk. They did nothing else, just took them off the cow's milk. They found the cow's milk caused inflammation of the bowel, paralyzed the bowel activity, resulted in fissures and pain. Kids couldn't move their bowels, took them off the cow's milk, and were completely cured. That's all. They didn't add more fiber to the diet, and didn't add more vegetables, didn't take them off the meat, just took them off the cow's milk. And then what they did is about 8 to 12 months later, they put them back on the cow's milk, and 100% of them within 5 to 10 days were severely constipated. Now, that is a big deal, don't you think? I think so. I mean, if we're just talking about that problem with kids, that would be a big deal. Oh, you want to talk about kids? Okay, let's talk about kids for a minute. 
I think it'd be nice to talk about kids because, you know, we can let anything happen to ourselves and we don't care because we're tough. But when it comes to kids, sometimes we get a little concerned. And by the way, what I'm going to say to you over the next few slides, maybe you don't want to hear. Maybe this is just too frank. So maybe you shouldn't listen. But this is really important to me. Let's talk about milk for a minute. Milk provides calories. Kids I don't know, know don't need more calories. As a matter of fact, 30% of the children in this country are overweight or obese. They don't need more calories. It provides saturated fat. Arteries in children as young as two years of age are already rotten from too much saturated fat. They're already getting atherosclerosis. They don't need more saturated fat. Cholesterol, it's loaded with cholesterol. They don't need more cholesterol. It's loaded with rocket fuel. <laughs> You've been watching the news. You've been watching the news over the last week. Now the milk's loaded with rocket fuel, contaminants, environmental contaminants. It's, why is it loaded with all these contaminants? Because it's high on the food chain, and it picks up the DDT, the PCB, the heptachlor, the rocket fuel, everything. It's loaded. So you got all those problems in the milk, and then it's also loaded with infection. It's full of BLV and BIV. You know what BLV and BIV are? Probably not. Let me explain it to you. BLV is bovine leukemia viruses. And BIV is bovine AIDS viruses, and they have E. coli and tuberculosis and listeria. You read about these things every day, every week in your paper. Somebody says, well, we had to withdraw the ice cream or the cheese or something because of salmonella or E. coli or listeria. In fact, the most commonly recalled products in the last 10 years are dairy products because of contamination. Well, let me talk to you about BLV for a minute. BLV is bovine leukemia viruses, and uh, this has been a controversy that's gone on since 1969. That's when they discovered it in the cows, bovine leukemia viruses. You know about leukemia viruses. You take your cat to the veterinarian, and you get the cat a immunization for leukemia viruses so the cat doesn't get leukemia. Well, they discovered leukemia viruses in the cows in this country in 1969. And they started to look around to see how many cows are infected. And what they found eventually was that 9 out of 10 herds are infected. 89% of the herds are infected in this country. Canada, it's 70%. Argentina, it's about 84%. You know, wherever you have a big beef economy, then they have lots of cows and lots of infected cows. But this is not a problem, according to the USDA. And according to the Cattlemen's Association, it's not a problem to have all these cows infected. You know why it's not a problem? It's not a problem because they couldn't detect it in human beings. They saw no infection in human beings, so it's not a problem. Now it's a problem. Now it's a problem because in December of this past year, at University of California, Berkeley, the researchers used the more modern techniques for detecting infection based upon the presence of antibodies. When you have antibodies in the blood, it means you've been infected. And what they found was that 74% of Americans have been infected with bovine leukemia viruses. Okay? So now it's a problem. All right, calcium and protein are better obtained from other sources. Get your calcium in the same place a rhinoceros does or hippopotamus. There's no such thing as dietary calcium deficiency. This is all fraud perpetrated by the dairy industry. If you are here last year, I went over some of that fraud with you. It's business, but the business hurts your kids. All right, so we have, as a result of all this advertisement by the dairy industry and unhealthy diets, we have a situation where kids are sick. I mean, look in your neighborhoods. The kids are fat, they're constipated, they have snotty nose. They go to the doctor every month with ear infections. Do you think that's God's plan? Do you think that's the way kids are supposed to be? They've got eczemas, they've got GERD. The kids are sick. They have arthritis, they have headaches. The kids are sick. The American Academy of Pediatrics Work Group looked at a very serious problem and made a statement which still stands. They made it 10 years ago, it still stands, and that is early exposure of infants to cow milk protein may be an important factor in the initiation of beta cell destructive processes in some individuals. You know what beta cell destructive processes are? Beta cells produce insulin in your pancreas. In other words, consuming cow's milk sets up an autoimmune reaction where your body destroys the pancreas of the child, and adult, by the way, and you get type 1 diabetes. That's what the American Academy of Pediatrics told us 10 years ago, and they still tell us the same thing. The avoidance of cow's milk protein for the first several months of life may reduce later development of insulin-dependent diabetes and delay onset in susceptible people. You want to talk about a disaster, a tragedy in a family, just give a member type 1 diabetes. You'll ruin their whole day. Problems. And you can find these problems. You want to look them up. 
You can go to my website. You can read my May 2003 newsletter. It's all there. All the things that I'm telling you about dairy products are all there. You can read about it. You can read the scientific references. You can show this to your physician. You can ask for people to challenge it. I ask for people to challenge me all the time. You know, I, I talk to medical groups. I talk to doctors. I write in, in medical journals. I'm waiting for the challenge. Tell me why this isn't right. Show me the contradictory evidence. I want to see it because it's not there. That's why I don't see it. Well, let me tell you about some of the things that are linked to, associated with, or definitely caused by the consumption of animal protein, in particular cow's milk. Loss of appetite, growth retardation, canker sores, gastroesophageal reflux, stomach cramps, abdominal distension. These are the upper intestinal problems. Type 1 diabetes. Lower problems like bloody stools, colitis, malabsorption, diarrhea, defecation problems, fecal soiling, chronic constipation, as I showed you. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Let's move on down through the body. Go to the respiratory system, nasal stuffiness, runny nose, otitis media, tonsil problems, asthma. How about to the bones and joints? Rheumatoid arthritis, which we're going to talk more about in just a minute. Lupus. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. You want to see a real sad situation? You look at a kid with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And you know that in the British literature almost 20 years ago, it was published that juvenile rheumatoid arthritis has been caused by cow's milk consumption. I mean, these are little kids. They look like they were in uh, refugee camps. They live to be about 20 years old. They sit in wheelchairs with deformed joints and tiny jaws, and they die right in front of you. I've had the chance to take care of two kids like this who were early in their disease who were smart enough, their parents were smart enough to get their diet changed, and they're completely free of the disease, as we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, all kinds of rashes you get from consuming these animal products, particularly dairy. You have uh, nervous system problems such as multiple sclerosis, which, by the way, I have extensive discussions about on my website because I have the privilege of taking over the Roy Swank multiple sclerosis treatment program. Roy Swank was the head of, it, head of neurology at the University of Oregon for 23 years, head of their medical department of neurology. And he shows that you can take somebody with MS early in their disease, treat them with a healthy diet, and they are essentially, well, the disease has stopped. Let's just put it that way. The chance of deteriorating over the next 35 years is less than 5%, as I told you yesterday. Any other theory, the chance of being in a wheelchair, bedridden, or dead is 50% in 10 years by any other therapy. Uh, next month's newsletter is going to be about Alzheimer's disease. So I hope you all do sign up. It's a free newsletter. You just go to my website, you put in your email address, and you get the newsletter. It's absolutely free. No gimmicks involved. You know, we tell you about some of the things that we do. Otherwise, we don't sell your name. We don't ding you with advertisements. It's just a newsletter. And you sign up on my website. Well, next month is going to be about Ronald Reagan's problem. Alzheimer's disease, the evidence is overwhelming that causes the rich American diet plus toxicity from aluminum. And I cited probably 70 references there. You can go to the research literature. This is a majority opinion. This is not a minority opinion. The only one that's really ticked off about this is the aluminum industry. And it also tells you ways to effectively treat Alzheimer's, and it's published in the scientific literature in our best journals. This stuff is just hidden because it doesn't have the backing of a lot of money. That's the only reason you don't hear about it. Anyway, that's next month's newsletter. All right, other kinds of problems, bedwetting problems. These are fun. You want to talk about problems, this is a big one. You take kids who have, quote, psychological problems. The psychological problem is this, is they are 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, and they wet their bed. So, you know, mom and dad, they think, well, it must be our fault. Maybe when we were changing their diaper when they were a little kid, we touched the wrong place, and now they're psychologically deranged. So we got to take them to the psychiatrist and get them cured. And, and you'll, you'll spend your money, you take them to the psychiatrist every month, and this goes on and on and on and on until somebody tells you what the problem is. The problem is this. You consume the milk. The milk goes through the gut wall into the bloodstream in susceptible kids. They have a leaky gut. It goes in, into the bloodstream. Then it, it is, it is uh, uh, secreted into the bladder. And in the bladder, it causes a, uh, an allergic kind of reaction so that the tissues inside the bladder swell. And when they become swollen, they become insensitive. So the child can't feel the urine build up in the bladder. And so what the child notices first and only is wet bed sheets. So you take the kid off the milk, and all of a sudden sensitivity comes back, and the psychiatric problem goes away. 
Uh, various types of problems like nephrotic syndrome, glomerulonephritis, anaphylactic shock, sudden infant death syndrome, oh, blood problems. Next, next, within, before I go to Costa Rica, we're going July, July 24th. Before I go to Costa Rica, I'm going to send you a story about a Star McDougaller. I'm going to talk to you about Star McDougaller. Star McDougallers are people who have made, uh, made uh, tremendous changes in their life that are teaching changes. That's the only reason I tell you stories about them, because they teach lessons. And the next one is going to be about a little girl. She was 11 years old when she got sick. She got a, a blood dyscrasia, which means her body was attacking her blood cells. It attacked her platelets, her white cells, her red cells. Attacked them so bad that things at the, at the worst of the situation, mom and dad were standing over her in the intensive care unit, and she had five tubes sticking out of her body. I mean, the next step is those of you who know in the medical business is the morgue. So, the child is dying. Fortunately, through the good care of her doctors and through the, uh, the efforts of some modern medicines to treat acute problems, she got out of the intensive care unit. And the doctors said, look, we're going to put her on all kinds of drugs, cancer, chemotherapy, prednisone, and so on. And dad was very, very upset about this, very against this, knew that this was temporizing at best. And so he searched for, quote, alternative medicines. He took them to Andrew Weil's clinic, and they got a bag full of pills and potions, and that didn't work. And eventually he found something that was simple, cost-free. In fact, too simple. That was the problem. It was too darn simple. It was just take and change the kid's diet. And it didn't cost him a thing, and it couldn't be very valuable. But he decided to do it anyway. And so he changed the diet, and the child got well in about, uh, well, very quickly. But about four or five months later, he wrote me and told me the story of his daughter. And I said, we need her as a star McDougall. We need to tell other parents about this so that their kids don't have to go through this and their family doesn't have. He says, I can't do this yet because I'm not sure it's true. Could be just an accident. You know, I can't do it. And I said, I understand. Well, just, you know, when you get confidence that the diet made the difference, the kid is drug-free, perfectly fine. Finally, at about nine months, he writes me, he says, I'm ready to tell the story. And so he sent me the story, sent me her medical records, which, by the way, I'm going to write up and try and get published in the journal Pediatrics as a letter to the editor so that other parents can, doctors can hear about this kid. <clears throat> but it was kind of interesting. He, he wrote me um, a couple days ago and he said, you know, I took my daughter to the doctor and the general practitioner looked over the whole situation and said, you know, you're right, the McDougall diet cured this kid. No question about it. But, you know, we, I'd like to have the specialist who's been taking care of her come in and see the, see the child just so he can see what's going on, too. When the kid's blood count's perfectly normal, perfectly healthy, active, girl, no medications, everything's just beautiful. Specialist comes in, looks over the situation, kind of nods and says, says, are you sure you don't want to take the drugs? I still think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and, the da and the dad got angry and almost punched the guy. Anyway, that's going, to be, that's going to be next month's Star McDougaller, so please sign up. It's a free newsletter. All right. Okay, let's talk about this, this particular publication. This was just last month in pediatrics. This gives you some idea of what's going on in terms of our health, just to focus on the general diet. That has to do with the effect of obesity on child's behavior. What they find in this particular article is overweight and obese children are more likely to be victims and perpetrators of physical and verbal bullying behaviors, such as name calling, teasing, rejection, rumors, sexual harassment, and physical damage. And of course, obesity has increased from 12% to 30% in our children in the, last, in the last 20 years. Doesn't this bother you? Does this really bother you? I mean, look at what we've just talked about in the last five minutes. We've talked about children being constipated, abused, obese, you know, they have acne, they have sore joints, headaches, stomach pains, rectal bleeding. Just think about the pain and suffering that goes on for a minute. What if that pain and suffering was caused by malnutrition from not enough food? What if these were starving children suffering with this kind of pain? Wouldn't you be up in arms? Wouldn't you walk out of this auditorium and go see your congressman, go see your health agencies, go see your doctor and say, we've got to stop this malnutrition because these children are starving and in pain? Wouldn't you? I would think you would. But because this malnutrition is due to overnutrition, because it's due to overnutrition, because it's due to something that 
your minister feeds the children, your policemen feed the children, something that's fed in church, something that's fed in school, something that your doctor approves of, it's okay. You know, if a stick-wielding adult caused this amount of pain in a child, that adult would be put in jail. But because it's caused by a fork and spoon, think about it for a minute. The hurt, the hurt is just as severe. The children suffer just as much, whether it's a stick or a fork and spoon, maybe more. But nobody does anything about it, and the children continue to suffer. Think about it. Okay, let's get back to the talk. Let's talk about uh, some of my patients again. You'll find these again under the Star of McDougall's. You want to read about any of these people more. This is the lady she calls herself a little stinker. I'm not going to tell you why, but you can guess. Uh, cholesterol was 199 because she ate southern fried everything in her diet, joint pain, stuffed up nose, sinusitis. Changed her diet, dropped her cholesterol. Remember, no cholesterol-lowering medications. That's what we're talking about. I'm sorry I lost you there for a minute. We're talking about cholesterol-lowering medications. Dropped her cholesterol about 55 points and lost some weight. Now, this lady is something else. About every three months, she sends me a new picture of herself. She says, whenever you give it a talk, you've got to change the picture. I want you to change the picture because I look even better now. So this is the last picture she sent me. Yeah, and, and I'll get another picture in about three months, but maybe in a bathing suit, who knows? But she's so proud of herself. So this is Joyce Shank, cholesterol 263. She was in the hospital several times for pneumonia and bronchitis. She had spinal stenosis, arthritis. Pretty sick lady, 310 pounds. She decided she'd had enough. Changed her diet, lost 132 pounds, dropped her cholesterol 100 points, no medications, no limitations. Uh, I want to make something real clear here. When you watch an infomercial or hear some of the, quote, you know, buy this pill or that pill or, you know, they say this is the best case scenario. Everybody shouldn't expect these results or nobody should expect these results. I want to tell you something. This is what you ought to expect. I want to make it absolutely clear. This is what you ought to expect. If you change your diet, go for a walk and clean up some bad habits because you will get these results. Of course, it won't cost you anything. Of course, nobody will make any money. It'll cut your food bill by 40%, but, you know, whatever. Stomach acid, two and three. Prilosec and Pravacid, number two and three selling drugs in this country, inhibit stomach acid. This guy, he's the head, of, head controller for the state of Wisconsin. He retires. He says, I'm dying. I'm retiring. I, you know, I've worked all my life to accumulate wealth, and I don't have my health. What am I going to do? Anybody know anybody in that situation? Okay, he says, look, the chest pains are so bad I can't walk up the steps. I'm depressed. I sleep all the time. I'm on a handful of pills, taking Tums all day long. I'm as sick as can be. My life is over. And he decides maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I'll do something about it. So he changes his diet, loses 40 pounds off all medication, drops his cholesterol and triglycerides again, and his blood pressure gets off all his medication. All right, here we have number five and number eight, Celebrex and Vioxx. We're looking at a $4 billion a year business, Celebrex and Vioxx. They don't work any better than aspirin or Advil or Motrin. They have less stomach distress, but there is evidence that they quadruple your chance of getting a heart attack over the more common Advil and Motrin, but they're not going to put that in the advertisement. So. Anyway, these things, they ca do cause gastric distress. They do cause problems with the joints. And uh, they are pain relievers, no question about it. But let's talk about arthritis for a minute. Uh, back when I was a medical resident, which was in the mid-1970s, I got this brochure. Now, they don't put this up brochure out anymore. This was put out by the Arthritis Foundation. But they put out brochures that have the same message, just a little softer words. And I promise you, you'll get the same message from almost every rheumatologist you see as I'm going to tell you about now. So it still stands. But let me just focus on this brochure I got 30 years ago. It was from the Arthritis Foundation. It was the truth about diet and arthritis. And what it says in the opening leaf, it says, the truth about diet and arthritis may surprise you. It is simply this. There is no, spe that's their capitalization, by the way. There is no special diet for arthritis. No specific food has anything to do with causing it. And no specific diet will cure it. Case settled. <coughs> okay, I'll tell you what this means to you and I and your doctor. If you notice that, for example, your arthritis gets worse when, say, you eat cheese, you go to your doctor and you say, look, my arthritis is worse when I eat cheese. Doctors can't be. 
diet has nothing to do with arthritis. Well, doctor, how do you know that? Well, look, I got this statement from the Arthritis Foundation, case settled. We don't even need to discuss it because you know the Arthritis Foundation has done hundreds of studies to prove this. Well, at least 100. Well, maybe 10. They probably did 10 studies. Well, maybe one. No, they didn't do or publish, and there does not exist a single study to support their point of view. I look 30 years ago, I look every day. There is not a single study to support that position, not one study in the scientific literature. And back then, when I first looked at it, there were about 15 studies that showed otherwise, and now there are over 25 studies that show not only is diet the cause of inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid and lupus and ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis and nonspecific arthritis. Not only is diet is the cause and fibromyalgia, not only is it the cause, but a healthy diet will cure it. And these are published in, in journals like The Lancet, Arthritis and Rheumatism, British Journal of Rheumatology, the best medical journals in the world publish these results. Yet, I guarantee you, you go to a rheumatologist and say, Doctor, does this have anything to do with my diet? Absolutely not. Case settled. <laughs> Next time that happens, says, Doctor, I would like to see the studies that support your strong point of view because you're condemning me to thousands of dollars of medication, deformity, and early death. So give me the studies. You'll find them empty-handed. All right, let's talk about Vanessa Jones for a minute. Vanessa, I've never met her. Vanessa's a great lady, a great young girl. We're getting back to children again. She's a woman now. She's definitely a woman now. When I met her, I guess she was a young girl. You know how it is when you get older, they all look younger, right? <laughs> Everybody looks young. Anyway, uh, so this was, this was uh, February of 2001. Vanessa's mother wrote me a letter. She, it's kind of an interesting story. She was uh, in the year 2000, November of 2000, she was applying for military service. So she went for her induction physical and she flunked. She flunked because she had protein in her urine, lots of protein in her urine. So she was then sent to her doctor and then on to a nephrologist. And what it was found is she had lupus nephritis. Lupus is an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself. Remember I told you it was first reported in Africa in 1960, and it's the most co and African Americans, blacks in this country, have the highest incidence of lupus of any subgroup in the whole, the whole country. And it's not virtually unknown in rural Africa or rural Asia. Anyway, so she's got uh, lupus. She's got uh, what her mom described as uh, four over five uh, kidney failure, which means they're getting her ready for dialysis. She's on cytoxin. She's on pregnisone. She's so sick. She is so sick and so deformed from the medications that she had a Christmas picture taken in December of 2000. And when it was sent out to the family members, she took and put a smiley face over her face because she didn't want anybody to see her moon face from the steroids. So her mother wrote me and asked if there's anything you can do. And I said, yeah, this is what you can do here. I sent her to the studies that are on my website about arthritis and autoimmune disease and how diet causes it. I said, read these. This is what you do. And, you know, I tell people, a lot of people that. A lot of, just like I've told some of you here this year and last year and the year before, I tell everybody that. You never know who's going to do it. So I really didn't plan on her doing anything about it, but I guess she thought her daughter was important enough to change her diet. So she did. So she did. But by April, she was off all of her medications, and she described her kidney disease as plus one over five, whatever that means. Anyway, she was a heck of a lot better. And then she writes me in October. She says, you know, I don't think the diet's working anymore. Started to get more protein in your urine. Blood pressure's going up. The doctor wants to put her back on blood pressure pills. And by the way, these, this, this whole scenario is described under the Star McDougallers on my website if you want to read the whole story. So anyways... Uh, she says, I don't think it's working anymore. I said, you go ask Vanessa what she's eating. Don't tell me it's not working anymore. So she did, and Vanessa's got a new job, and they're serving donuts at break time. <laughs> so I said, look, you've got to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Vanessa. Vanessa. This is her life. You know, tell her to get it figured out because she's dying. So she did. She had a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and this is how she's doing now. She is... Uh, she has no protein in urine. She's on no blood pressure pills. She has no lupus. She's on no medication. She's actually back in school. She decided the Army wasn't for her. And she's, uh, we're not going to get into politics today, folks. The Army's not for her. And she decided that uh, she's entering a beauty contest, a whole new life this young woman has. 
Gene Brown, in my early 30s, I was in constant pain, unable to turn a doorknob, squeeze a toothpaste tube, lift my legs onto a bed. She's on Plaquenil, Naproxen, Synthroid, Pamilar. In two months after a healthy diet, she shops, gardens, walks. There are 25 studies. They're on my website. Go read them. Go read the journals. You will not find a single study that says otherwise. Go throw them in your doctor's face. Now. Some of the doctors will be glad you did that. Yes, they will. Because a lot of doctors really care about their patients and aren't defensive. A lot of doctors, and I'm sure the doctors in this room are that way. They really want to help their patients, want to know. In fact, I believe all doctors really want to help patients. But, you know, you kind of get into this uh, I know everything thing. And it gets kind of threatening when the patient knows more than you do. So be careful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, antidepressants, do you remember the days when everybody wasn't on antidepressants? I mean, it wasn't too long ago, but drugs 6, 7, and 9, as far as the 10 leading drugs, 6, 7, and 9 are antidepressants. Isn't that amazing? It just blows you away. George Orwell's Brave New World, 1984. Those days have arrived, folks, when we're all on psychotropic, mood-altering drugs. And here they are. Numb the world! <laughs> Here's one of my depressed patients. His name's Mike Wilson. Severely depressed, has type 2 diabetes, arthritis. And by the way, he became my patient 22 years ago. He's still my patient. 22 years ago, arthritis, gout, sleep apnea, insomnia, back pain, neck pain, congestive heart failures, heart had stopped. He's in chronic pain. He's 450 pounds on 25 medications. You know what stopped him? He said, you know, I can't play with my kids. I got two kids, I can't play with my kids, I'm dying. I'm gonna do something about it. So he did something about it. By the way, he was on the Donahue show. About two years ago when Donna was, Donahue was on cable, they wrote me and asked me if I could uh, provide a couple of patients for their show. They didn't want me on, but they want my patients. So I sent, I sent Mike there, and the Atkins people, they sent some people there too. And I wanna tell you, if I, if I had the chance to show you the, the, the Donahue show, and I just showed the pictures of the people. No sound, just the pictures of the people. The Atkins ladies, and they were all ladies, they'd get up there and they were 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight, and they looked sick. Drawn, sunken eyes, gray, sallow, sick looking people. That's because they're sick, because they're eating a diet that makes you sick. What would you expect? All right. And then I did, anyway, I don't get into that. That was yesterday's talk. Uh, but Mike. Uh, Mike got up, Mike stood up, and along with the other patient I sent there had lost 90 pounds, Mike stood up and he looked phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal, okay? And he's medication free, plays ball with his kids, his life's back, he's been my patient for 22 years. High blood pressure, I skipped now to number 13 because I just wanna talk about the calcium channel blockers. There are three categories of drugs I will not prescribe. I'm a real doctor, I prescribe drugs, lots of drugs. Not lots of drugs, a few drugs. I know all about a lot of drugs. But there are three categories of drugs I will not prescribe. One is sulfonylureas for diabetics. Okay, they're the most commonly prescribed still diabetic drug because they kill people. It says so in the physician's desk reference. It says it'll increase your risk of dying of heart disease by two and a half times. It says it'll kill you. Why would I prescribe it? it? Sounds stupid. I don't prescribe calcium channel blockers. That's because the evidence says it'll increase your risk of dying of heart disease, cancer, depression, suicide, bleeding problems, and it makes you stupid. I mean, life's tough enough without taking a medication that makes you stupider. <laughs> and I won't prescribe medroxyprogesterone, which is Provera, which fortunately most of you know is dangerous. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, those are the drugs I won't prescribe. Uh, instead, most of the time we take people off blood pressure pills. These are the results from 1,250 of our people. Seven over five millimeter drop in blood pressure for the whole group. If you start with real high blood pressure, the drop is 23 over 14 millimeters of mercury. This generally occurs within 48 to 72 hours and almost everybody's off all their medication. The exceptions are if you come in with a bag full of pills, I won't scare you by stopping them all. Unless you don't scare easy, then I might do that. And also, if you're on beta blockers, I stop them slowly. But otherwise, most people are off all their medications. I mean, almost everybody is by the time they leave the program. And that's in 10 days that way. 10 days. 10 days. You know, I heard some of you say, and Mary was laughing at me this morning because she was talking to somebody who had some lung problems. And Mary says, well, why don't you change your diet? She said, well, it's not bad enough. Okay. I'll tell you, you think it's too hard to change your diet. I know you do.
So uh, listen, Mary and I will lock you up for 10 days and make you do it. And it'll cost you one-tenth as much as the bypass surgery you're facing. And you'll love us for it. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, someday, I think I gave the GI talk here a couple years ago, but I got all new slides for the GI talk. All brand new slides for the GI talk. And they're all done by this man. He's the head medical illustrator of the National Institutes of Health. Phenomenal artist, unbelievable artist. I met him about five years ago. He had an angioplasty, two stents, was on a bag full of pills, blood pressure pills, cholesterol pills, all kinds of pills. And he's very, very frightened about his health, to say the least. And so I worked with him over the years and got him in pretty good shape. He, again, is one of those people that keeps me a, a running report on his health. And so I heard a couple of days ago his cholesterol is now 132 on no medication. He's off all blood pressure pills and so on. But it was not easy to get Howard off his blood pressure medication. Howard was very, very dependent on these medications, very much believing in the medical system. I understand that. I mean, billions of dollars are taught us to be that way. And plus, he was loyal to his doctor, really loyal to his doctor, and he felt he'd done enough to hurt his doctor's feelings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Howard and I, Howard and I, we were in, on the Alaska cruise two years ago, June. We're in Alaska together. That's Mary and I and uh, uh, kayaking with some of our friends on this trip. We took uh, 68 people to Alaska that year. And Mary's parents were there, too. Mary's parents are 93. They were, like, 91 years old kayaking among the icebergs. Phenomenal health, both of them. Anyway, Howard and I are start standing on the deck of this ship, right? We're standing on the deck of this ship and we're talking and I'm saying, Howard, look, you've gotten off about, uh, you know, five blood pressure pills and cholesterol pills and life is good. I said, you're on these calcium channel blockers, which I told you I absolutely hate. Why won't you stop this last pill? He says, I don't want to hurt my doctor's feelings. I said, well, Howard, I tell you what, after much thought, I said, Howard, I will tell you what, I've got, a, I've got a compromise here. Why don't you do this? Why don't you every morning take the pill, put it in your mouth, switch it around, spit it out. Then you can tell your doctor you took it. <laughs> and we're standing on the deck of this ship, and he says, John, he says, I'm not going to start now, he says, because I don't want to poison the fish. <laughs> All right. I was at a conference recently. Uh, I told you I was at St. Helena Hospital. This was, uh, I left about two years ago. I'd been there 16 years practicing, and now we practice at a resort. And for some very good reasons. It's, it's, it's a much better situation for the patients, mainly. But anyway, uh, we were at St. Helena Hospital. I didn't go to many noontime conferences. The reason is, is because every time I'd walk in the room, the guy from Eli Lilly or Pfizer was sitting in the back, and I knew he bought the lunch. And I knew he bought the speaker. So, you know... Uh, I didn't really need any more of the same old diatribe about drugs, so I don't go very much. Anyway, one day, though, I, I, I got a notice that this, there was a lecture scheduled that was titled, Diabetes is Caused by Fat, Not Sugar. And I go, man, we got somebody here who really knows what they're talking about. I got to go hear that. So I gathered all my staff, and we went down to the lunchroom. And I should have known there was a problem because the guy from Pfizer was sitting in the back of the room, and he paid for the lunch. And then the next indication was the speaker was fat and greasy with a ponytail. And I figured this is going to be a long day. But I'm going to sit there anyway. So I sat and listened to this guy talk to me about how to take care of a diabetic. And I do not exaggerate. When we got done, that man had the diabetic on 20 different kinds of pills. And you know what he called it? And the doctors in this room have heard this term because that's what the drug companies are using these days. Boy, does this sound sexy. This is high tech. Man, who wouldn't buy into this? We call it polypharmacology. Whoa! Polypharmacology, that's how we take care of our patients. So we had them on something for blood pressure like Norvas, something for blood sugar control like glucophage, both by the way I won't prescribe because they kill people. We had them on something for the cholesterol, something for the uric acid, something for the homocysteine like folic acid, something for the triglycerides, something for the aspirin isn't good enough anymore, we've got to have the two dollar pill, the Plavix. Something to lose weight, something for the headache, something for the body ache, something for the indigestion, something for the constipation, on and on and on and on and on. And we got done with the lecture and I said, I raised my hand and I said, no wait a minute, the title of your lecture was Diabetes is Caused by Fat, Not Sugar. I said, you didn't mention diet during the whole hour presentation. I said, I, I, what's, what's, what did I miss here? He says, I got you here, didn't I? I said, yeah, you got me here. And then I went on to discuss some of the drugs that he prescribed and how harmful they were. And he had nothing to say. And then one of, uh, one of my colleagues here 
One of my colleagues got up and apologized for my behavior. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it. I'm used to it. They said, well, this is Dr. McDougall. You know, he's really interested in food. You know, please forgive us. And, you know, I asked the same doctor. We're walking out of the room. I asked the same doctor. I said, I said, look, I said, John, I said, my colleagues really don't believe this is how you properly take care of a diabetic patient, do they? And he says, yes, we do. And I said, you know, it's time for me to move on. Okay. The connection between the food and diet is so close that I believe the pharmacy and surgery departments of every hospital owe a kickback to the food service. They're supporting the business. The food service is right there to keep the people sick. Here you are laying in the hospital. You just had a massive heart attack. Somebody ripped your chest open. You look at the doctor and you say, Doctor, I'd eat cardboard not to be here again. A teaching moment. The doctor comes in and says, Geez, we don't know what causes this. Well, it looks like a good cheeseburger. Merck's indebted to McDonald's, folks, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you why it's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. It's because of this. It's because of the margins. These are some of the figures. For Celebrex, to sell a patient 100 pills is $130. To make 100 pills is 60 cents. Norvask, $188 for 100 pills. To make them is 14 cents. That's 140. 134,000% difference in margin. You're never going to stop that. All you can do is save yourself and your families. If I had a, a thousandth, a millionth of that money, I could, I could put these guys out of business. But, you know, some people in the industry know, for example, Alan Roses, Vice President of Galaxo, he made a statement that really got him in trouble. In fact, it was published worldwide. It was such a profound statement and the reaction was so strong. He said the vast majority of drugs only work in 30 to 50 percent of the people. He was being generous. Let me tell you why they don't work. It's a simple concept and let me explain and give credit where credit is due. The medical business is very successful when it comes to acute care problems and we should be proud of this. Doctors feel good, patients are grateful when we deal with acute care problems. Acute care problems are things like lacerations, infections, broken bones. Get a laceration, doctor comes in, sews up the wound, heals straighter, faster, everybody's excited. It's a great, great business, great relationship. Break a bone, straighten the bone, get an infection, give an antibiotic, tilt the balance in favor of the patient. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it works. But note that acute problems are due to single injuries to the body, like the cut, the break, the attack of the bacteria. Chronic diseases are due to multiple injuries to the body. For example, if I had a nervous habit, I scratched myself every day for 10 minutes, I would develop a sore on my hand, I would continue to have the sore, even if I put the most expensive antibiotic cream that Upjohn Company makes, I would continue to have that sore on my hand until I did what? Stop the repeated injury. I used to have a terrible disease. I could give you an all hour lecture on how sick I was before I got wisdom. I used to have a terrible disease. I would cough and wheeze all the time. I had gunk coming out of my lungs. I went to the doctor for help. I got acute care solutions. I got cough syrups, wheezing pills, chest x-rays, spironograms. And I would have died except for the fact that on October 20th, 1972, I got wisdom and strength. And I stopped injuring myself 40 times a day with Marlboro cigarettes. OK, so the way you cure chronic disease, this is all too simple. It's really too simple. In fact, I should tell you right now, I, I kind of made a lot of this up. This program I'm teaching you doesn't work unless you buy these little green pills. I can't sell them today. I know it's Saturday. But I've got these little green pills, okay? And in the pills, you have a couple of florets of broccoli, uh, a, a tenth of a leaf of lettuce. Uh, you've got a, 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 couple of, uh, a couple of flakes of wheat. And in these, my, the diet I recommend, the, the, the exercise, doesn't work unless you buy these pills from me, and they're $2.75 a piece. And they've got an M on side. M stands for money or McDougal. You take your choice. And for those of you who think that's not powerful enough pill, I've got a super version. It's $12.95 a pill, and I put three poppy seeds in it. And that will cure you for sure. So don't you try the diet and exercise without buying my pills, okay? Because I know it's not going to work for you unless you do. Okay. Let's get back to the seriousness of it, and that is that what you do to cure disease is you identify the source of repeated injury. 
you identify the source of repeated injury and you stop that behavior. Identifying the source of repeated injury is easy. Stopping that behavior is hard. That's why I consider it a great privilege to be here to talk to you, to help encourage you to stop that destructive behavior. That's why I feel so fortunate to have a 10-day living program where I can lock you up and make you do this. That's why I feel fortunate the whole world is starting to get on board and starting to head you in a better direction these days, and it is. Because stopping the behavior is the hard part, but identifying the source of repeated injury is easy. Here's the source of repeated injury. It's four and more feasts a day. Every day we start out with Easter for breakfast, we go on to Thanksgiving and Christmas for lunch and dinner, and every night after dinner we have a birthday party. That's why you're fat and sick, just like the kings and queens of old. What's wrong with this slide? What, what's wrong with this slide? I, I really, by the way, I am the luckiest doctor in the world. I'm the happiest doctor in the world. I don't, no question about it. I, I really am. Because my patients get well. And the, the return I get, if you, I know you figured it out. You wouldn't be here in this auditorium. You know that the happiness you get in life comes from helping other people. If you haven't figured that out, I think you better get busy because you're missing life. So I'm in the luckiest doctor in the world because I get to help people all day long by these simple messages. But what's wrong with this picture? What I'm doing is law. You can't throw these drugs in the toilet. It ends up in our environment. Thank you very much. <laughs>